Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of Ooh La La. Welcome back. Hello, I'm Sam. I'm Alistair. And you're back with us for another recap of an episode of Doctor Who. Yes, this week we're looking at uh, series one of The Revival, episode two. The End of the World. Yes, now this, it was aired on Saturday the 2nd of April 2005. Do you remember the day? Um, I remember a feeling of existential terror after it aired <laughs> and like like physically shaking when I walked up the stairs to bed after that. Um, that's that's my only memory of this. That was your like initial feeling with this one, it's just like existential dread and terror. Yeah, complete horror, like the first realization <laughs> as a like nine year old that one day everything would die. <laughs> this... And I was like, oh, okay. That's Both, a lot. I don't know whether or not you'd face death or like learnt about it as a concept in 2005, but this is the first time you fully just realised, oh, I'm not going to be here forever. One day the world will just burn. The one, yeah. Everything will end. The sun will expand, everything will be gone, even our graves. And I was like, aha, uh-huh, that's <laughs> a lot to process. The End of the World, again, written by our good friend, Russell T Davies. I feel like a friend of RTD <laughs> is like a the new friend, friend of Dorothy. Do you know what I mean? Oh, a, fr- a friend of Russell. <laughs> friend of Russell. Yes, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> that's oh my the god! One. So our dear old friend Russell wrote this episode, and it was directed by Euros Lynn. Now Euros Lynn had previously directed A Mind to Kill and Casualty, and he then went on to direct shows like well, he did the whole of Torture the Children of Earth, he did yes. that whole series, yeah, uh, Sherlock, Black Mirror, Daredevil, and of course Heartstopper, which yes. I love. I like petitioned to work on that show. I was really trying to get there, but alas, yeah, it and, wasn't to be. And given the massive success of that, I do wonder as well: will he be back to direct some Doctor Who? Uh, now that we've got Russell at the helm again. Mm, that I was wondering that actually people talk a lot about Stephen Moffat whether he'd come back to like write the odd episode or something I would love a little guest appearance you know yeah. what I <laughs> everyone's gonna hate me <laughs> I would welcome a guest Chibnall appearance I think give him a chance to redeem himself I think <laughs> certainly for this series let the man have a break let the man he let... would not he did a lot yes. of good he did a lot of good um yeah. I think give him give him a break. I doubt he's being invited anywhere near it. I don't think so. Not yeah. right now. I agree. The story is super super strong. Mm-hmm. And the CGI. <laughs> I thought there was something else. Up. <laughs> I was saving that, but the CGI is also there. And you know, I hear a lot of people whoa. say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" <laughs> a lot of people say, you know, how remarkable it is for 2005, and how much money was spent on it, and you know, how much of a blockbuster it felt at the time, and how dazzling the visuals were at the time. It's very hard to imagine from where we stand now in 2022 that this was really remarkable back then, because it feels. You know, I, yeah, I mean, I see what you mean. I think I kind of. Um... Looking at it now, there are definitely some screen grabs. I saw someone sharing these on Twitter actually recently. Um, specific screenshots. That I think all they've done is like up the contrast or something. And to my eye, eighty percent of it holds yeah. up now. I do get your point. What you were saying about. I mean, this episode basically ate up the entire budget for the series in this one episode. I think it's something like two hundred and six CGI visual effect shots in this compared to like just over a hundred, which was in the movie Gladiator. Yeah. So it really did eat up the series budget and. I think Russell made a conscious decision to say early on in the series, I want to make as much of a spectacle as I can to really show people, wow, this is what Doctor Who is yes. now. And they achieved that. Like, it does feel like we're in a real sci-fi. We're far off into the future. It, it still feels immersive. It's not distracting the visuals at all. I think, yeah, the the exterior shots, you get a lot of shots of kind of the Earth, obviously, um, mm-hmm. the space station. All of those are really great. I think there's a few slightly ropier moments, maybe with Cassandra, uh, mm. you know, Miss Cassandra, our huge... Um, living stretch of skin and um, the even the robot spiders there's some points where they kind of there are a couple of they look a little pasted onto the scenes Mm. they're in I think and this is something that I sort of I I stand by this for a lot of things not just Doctor Who I think that often it's not necessarily the animation that's the issue it's the composition with bringing the animated bits into the film and so it might not be necessarily that it's animated poorly it's that it's composited badly into the scene and i think robot spiders are definitely like a good example of that um should we do a quick sort of recap on the episode yes please so this picks up basically exactly where we left off in the last episode and i actually thought that was interesting it's one of the only episodes to pick up literally from the frame of the last episode i think yeah. the only other ones i can really think of is maybe like the doctor's daughter did yeah that. yeah but ones that aren't two parties anyway and apparently there was a push from russell to actually have these air on the same night because they kind of work back to back almost like a two-parter yeah no i can see it. it's more like an introduction movie i guess to the show yeah the doctor takes rose five billion years in the future i think it's like five billion and 5.5 slash apple slash something someone did do the re- someone 23 did research 
five event dash apple dash 26 20, 23 20, 26 I, that was pretty close someone did that well someone did rewatch the episode i really like the idea that we can use what three words for our years in the future because the is just too big <laughs> they just need something more specific <laughs> that or or that century is owned by apple one or the other i think it's probably the latter tim cook's really pushing for that mm. Um, so the Doctor takes Rose to the year 5 billion to show her the end of the world. He wants to show her something. He wants to mess her up. He does want to mess her Poor up. Poor girl. <laughs> is that, oh, go on then. Let's have a little, let's have a little. 100 years, 1,000 years. No, let me show you the let's end of your destruction the of your planet. He's like, I've just come from something really traumatic for me personally, and I'd like you to feel the same dread. <laughs> I don't want to be the only one in this mind space right now. Yeah. So do you want to see a world die? So after a series of fake outs, the Doctor takes her to the year 5 billion or something. They go to a space station to watch the sun expand and destroy the Earth. Mm -hmm. Because apparently the National Trust has been holding it back until then, but the money's dried up. I didn't realise the funding would last that long. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a load of aliens on the space station. It's the first time Rose gets to meet a bunch of aliens. And there is a mysterious person on board that wants to try and destroy the space station with the Doctor and Rose on it. So the ship is sabotaged by stretchy, bitchy trampoline, mm -hmm. stretch of skin, Miss Lady Cassandra, who heralds herself the last human everyone else on board is super wealthy she wants to make some money by killing them and investing in their competitors mm -hmm. um and that's that's about it really and the doctor saves the day ending with lady cassandra exploding in front of everyone yes yeah she begs to be moisturized and he declines he says everyone has the time and everyone dies much to rose's shock to which he then brings her back to earth and they grieve over chips in a certified savage last of the time lords fury of the time lords moment <laughs> this is the first time we see the psychic paper this is the first time we see the psychic paper it's mm. the first time we see there's another trick they add in here this is the first time they add the psychic paper and the translation matrix in the TARDIS so mm. I think two really good concepts that help speed up the plot um, classic who mm -hmm. the episodes used to have a lot more padding um, sometimes four-parter episodes, which had a lot more time to kind of set the scene and mm -hmm. allow the Doctor to kind of get acquainted with the locals and kind of maybe earn trust from the people he was meeting. Yeah. This helps bypass that because he can kind of uh, use his psychic paper to introduce himself as, as someone. Here he introduced himself as a guest to the mm. space station. And kind of integrate himself immediately. Yeah. And then the other really cool concept they add is the translation matrix. So this kind of fills the gap of why do aliens speak English? And the answer is they don't. You can just hear them mm. speak English because the TARDIS gets in your head. See, it really surprises me that these are introduced in this episode. It's something that Russell brought to the show because it, at least now for me, having grown up watching this era of Doctor Who... I find it really difficult, especially even when I watch classic episodes, to believe that these weren't concepts that were involved in the years that we had classic yeah. who. Like, it feels like now it's obvious that that's why we all hear English and why everyone's speaking English. And I can't believe that the Doctor hadn't been using the psychic paper to get into places. Because like you said, they kind of poke fun at classic Doctors because... Um, in Time Crash, for example, when the 10th Doctor met the 5th Doctor, he'd be like, oh, I can save the universe with a kettle and a string. Like, it was a lot more hands-on yeah, and handsy, yeah. whereas now, I think having that crutch, and it could be seen as a crutch being like, oh, this is why I'm here, psychic paper. It does move the story along. It does keep the episode at the pace I think it should be. So I, I just think it's a really interesting and beneficial aspect to add to the show from Russell. Yeah, something interesting about the phone call that Rose makes back home to her mum I had assumed, and I think you'd assumed, that that stays relative to when a companion kind of leaves. Mm. It hints here that the Doctor isn't always on the mark, and it kind of almost acts as a little uh, teaser for the Aliens of London episode where uh, he accidentally brings Rose back a year after she left. Mm. And you'll notice that when she rings Jackie, Jackie asks her to put a quid on the lottery, which is impossible because the lottery's gone. Wilson's dead. Her job's gone. <gasps> it blew up. Oh, my God. So, I never realised that. Yeah, so I guess she's just rung Jackie on some on Bef some random on Wednesday. On some random Wednesday before... Because she made a point in saying, like, are you hungover or something? But, like, yeah. Oh, my God, I never even thought about that. Of course she's not hungover. It's, 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 it's meant it's, to be just after, it's, like, her job's blown after. It's the day after Jackie got nearly killed by Auton. So I think that's quite interesting. Speaking of the Doctor, one thing that I think this episode shows really well is he's taken Rose, this 19-year-old girl, off to a world of adventure to show her all these things. I get the vibe that he's sort of trying to push her limits to see whether or not it's worth having her around to see whether she'll be worthy of like being his companion yeah i think um i think he's deliberately 
trying to push her to the extremes to see if she can hack it. You know, when she says, is it always this dangerous? And he says, yep. I think probably he thinks that's his fair warning. Mm. And uh, after this kind of fake outs and then he says, right, I know exactly where we're going to go. Mm. Um, there's something actually quite sinister about that. Yeah. In that exactly where he's going to take her is to kind of uh, witness something of a kind of mirroring of what he's experiencing, kind of mm. losing his planet and seeing it destroyed. Yeah. Even though hers isn't permanently gone and from her perspective it's still there kind of where she came she from can go time. back to it yeah and he can't um yeah there's something in that about kind of almost I, I don't know if it's wanting to see how she'll react to it or if it's wanting to feel that there's a shared experience and, and an element of shared understanding maybe it's a case of like he's just gone through all the trauma like i said he's had to watch his world be destroyed and he just wants to see if she can at least empathise with him. Because at this point, he hasn't told her. She keeps asking him throughout the episode, like, where are you from? What are you doing yeah. here? And I think this is a really another really great way of having Rose be the audience's perspective. Because when he does take her to the end of the world, and he... I think there is a part of his eye saying, look at this amazing thing. You're going to get to see the end of the earth. What an amazing thing that you would never got to see otherwise. And she is just stunned in silence. She does not say anything. She she just looks scared almost. And mm. then later in the episode when she was talking to the plumber and she realises that she doesn't know anything about the Doctor. She's just gone with him. She doesn't know who she is. She's really like pressing him. She's like, who are you? Tell me where you are. Where are you from? And then when he tells her about the translator matrix, she's like, that's inside my head. You're messing with my brain and you didn't even think to ask for permission. I feel like there's something genuinely interesting to be said about kind of like consent in this episode. Mm. No one else apart from Rose, I think, challenges how freaky it is that the Doctor has this machinery that kind of gets inside your mind and changes the way you experience the world. Mm -hmm. And that's never brought up again after this. Um, but I think there's a lot about kind of, you didn't even ask. Um, you just assumed it would be fine. And it's kind of the same with, you know, taking her to this place. He doesn't explain where she's going to be. You know, she says, what's outside those doors? He doesn't actually answer her. He just kind of says, you know, go out there and find out for yourself. He doesn't um, say anything. He literally just puts up his hand. He just and, puts up his yeah. hand and kind of, yeah, guides her out the door. So I think there's meant to be something that feels quite dangerous about him here. I think mm. that really that really plays off. You've got this really good duality with the way that Christopher Eccleston plays this. Mm -hmm. In that, in his lighter moments, he's really funny and I think he lands the comedy really well. And he's got this kind of lightness of mm -hmm. kind of like a like a silly uncle mm. is the way I think about it. But then when he goes dark, he goes dark. And it's he's scary. Got this... He can be really scary. Yeah, he's obviously a really kind of pained, mm. strange, lonely man. And um, and he's quite frightening. And yeah. yeah, you're right. There are moments in the episode where you become aware of Rose's vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and you remember how young she is. Yeah. And yeah, it's 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 scary as well because I guess as a viewer, Rose is the character you experience this world most closely with. Mm. She's the one who you relate to. She is kind of the human perspective on all this. So uh, yeah, you you're scared for her as well. So at the end, when Jabe is with the Doctor, there's those comically big fans that he has to run through. Because at this point, Cassandra has already sabotaged the ship and everything's burning. And he has to go to turn a lever off at the other end of these fans to put the shields back on. So Jabe sacrifices herself to let the Doctor go through the fans. And I think at this point, we do get a hint that the Doctor, like, has otherworldly powers when he's able to sort of step through that final fan. I think mm. that then comes up throughout the whole show at times. Mm. There are a few, yeah, really cool alien superpowers for Dr. Gaz. One is that strange, yeah, something happens where he seems to almost like close his eyes and sense when he can step through this, this blade that you shouldn't be able to survive. Um, kind of calls back to episode one where he says, I can feel the earth turn mm. and has that kind of freaky speech with Rose. Yeah. But there's a few other things that happen after that. Um, uh, the first episode he has with Martha in the hospital, he kind of absorbs all this X-ray radiation through his body and channels it out into his foot. Mm -hmm. um, there's an episode in the Family of Blood in the Martha series again, series three, where he... Oh, the cricket ball. Yeah, he does this kind of trick shot with a cricket ball, which was uh, impossible to calculate. And he, he does that. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, he has that weird sense of taste that gets carried through as well. So um, He just can't the... have pears can't have pears but you know the christmas invasion he tastes the blood and he can tell what blood type it is oh yeah so there's little like tricks like that and i like the, that that's how it's usually referred to is, is as kind of a time lord trick um which i think is quite cool the doctor's also very good with heights so smashing mm. through the ceiling at the end of time oh yeah um, at the end of series four um mm. and also smashing through the roof of a train at the beginning of jodie whittaker's run in I, series was, 11. I watched that recently and i was like 
how on earth... Because like, I was like, when she was falling out of the TARDIS, she was above the Earth, like out of the atmosphere. And I was like, something's going to have to stop her. And no, she just falls through a She train. was definitely above clouds. Um, I think <laughs> I think the answer was just that she was so Freshly, recently regenerated yeah. that she was essentially invincible. Do you reckon she gave those powers to Tegan when she fell down that elevator shaft? I think clearly so. Tegan, time not confirmed? Yes. <laughs> or everything that happens after that point is just... Uh, a hallucination. Mm. So the Doctor goes back to Cassandra towards the end, and I've got to say, it's so camp, her bringing in what she probably knows isn't a Nightpod, that mm. huge record player earlier in it, and she's like... Hey, she doesn't know. You reckon? I know, yeah, no, she, probably, yeah she probably doesn't know. We don't, and what do we know about billions of years ago? Nothing. I We're guessing. Didn't exist. Um, and she puts on Toxic by Britney Spears, and I genuinely think that was like my introduction to the song, Toxic. Yes. I just think that's so calm. That was the exact moment that the seed was planted in all of our minds and turned us gay. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, this is just such a random fact with that vinyl. Um, there never was a Toxic vinyl from Britney Spears. She never released it on vinyl. So the art, oh. so the art department had to make a fake vinyl for it. So when the, you see the one printer saying Toxic, that was a fake vinyl. It just never existed on That's vinyl. That's a good fact. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. So then the Doctor reveals that Lady Cassandra is the villain of the episode. And yes. I feel like this brings in one of the many quotable parts of this episode. There was the bit where Jackie goes, it's Wednesday all day, what is it? You've got a hangover. And yeah. then in this bit when Cassandra just goes, spiders, activate. <laughs> spiders, activate. I don't know what it was in my like childhood brain, but I just kept saying that all the time. <laughs> I would just be walking around and I'd be like, spiders, activate. <laughs> or like, Wednesday child. all day, you've got a hangover. And I like, didn't even know what <laughs> hangover was all at day. that point. you got a hangover. <laughs> Oh my god, I might have to pick that up now. Um, <laughs> I do remember being really intrigued about the Doctor's origin, because I think when the show came back, there was a lot of question marks around what would be canon and what wouldn't from mm. the classic series. And I know people say there is no canon in Doctor Who, but there is some to an extent. Yeah. Um, and at this point, I guess it wasn't confirmed. Like, is the Doctor a Time Lord? The, the Not for the new Who, yeah. The, the, the most recent movie was kind of the... the one of the biggest pieces of media right before this, and that kind of made him half human. Yeah. yeah. I was wondering, going not going into this, but like looking back on Classic Who, how much Russell must have thought, okay, I'm going to ignore this, and how much he's going to bring in. I think yeah. that bringing in the time was a really clever way of saying, I'm not going to feel like I have to stick to what's gone before, because the Doctor had been on trial with the Time Lords, he'd like worked with them, he'd done all this stuff, and it meant that he didn't have to rely on that crutch. But like you said, it also really kept new viewers intrigued as to Doctor Who. I don't know who you are, I don't know where you're from, you're living this world through Rome as well yeah. was sort of on the same page as her yeah but i remember really wanting to see what was on jabe's um scanner because mm. they obviously brought up kind of identify species and um you don't get to see what it says yeah and she goes oh, impossible and it's clearly so shocking to her You're like, yes. what's going on and um yeah i remember we had uh, me and my sister this uncle that is is such a classic who fan mm. and we'd quiz him all the time or what does that mean what's a time lord what's gallifrey is he still from there and um he's like i don't know i don't know but i remember finding that really really interesting <laughs> no that's really true I, I remember vividly throughout like i actually remember throughout series one i would turn to my parents at different points because both of them to whatever Ever extent had watched up to it was more so my dad i think and jumping into the end of the series remember for the next time when you saw the emperor of the darts in the finale they heard his voice and both of them went oh, davros and i sat there as a little kid and i vividly remember going davros oh my knowing god. how like no, having no clue who davros was and i was just like oh my god that's yeah. so interesting yeah they thought that's who that was they thought that's who it was and they like had enough knowledge of the show before to like think that's who that oh, was wow. so i do remember turning to them for points of reference being like do you know who they are do you know who they are yeah that's mm. so interesting um so the doctor saves the day and unfortunately this means unfortunately to me because i love cassandra mm. cassandra blows up like the bitchy trampoline she is and one thing i always thought was interesting watching this episode and the next series mm. is that when spoiler alert for a show from 2006 when cassandra comes back in the next series i think she doesn't recognize the doctor because he's regenerated but she seems more pissed off at rose she's like oh rose you're the one that caused my death but in this scene rose comes up to the doctor and she really is the humanity being the only true human in the room yeah. she says to him like don't let her die help her i think she's probably very jealous of rose i think she looks at her and she sees kind of a, a you know a full flashy curvy <laughs> but very beautiful human and probably recognizes that mm. that's kind of what a human being looks like yeah and probably she feels, feels um yeah pretty vulnerable against that yeah and one thing as well that i forgot to mention earlier is that cassandra at least 
to the audience's ears is certainly gender non-conforming, possibly trans. She mentions being a little boy on Earth, and mm-hmm. I think that's really interesting. Or maybe just at this point in the universe, it's not meant to be that big of a point, and gender just isn't really a thing, and you can like flip between them. Like, I just think that's an interesting thing that Russell added that. I don't necessarily see a non-queer showrunner or writer including. I think a lot of writing of queer characters in Doctor Who has been very coded to making either their sexuality be something they mention all the time or something they never mention at all. Because why do I need to mention it? It's, it's just my sexuality. It's not who I am. But I think having those little moments really do show that this was someone like Russell T Davies writing the show. Interesting. Mm. And then the Doctor takes Rose back to Earth, and what do they do? They grieve over chips that he can't afford because it's only money. Oh, yeah. I think this is the <laughs> nicest bit of the episode. I think like there's a lot of heart running through the whole thing, um, but this is, I think, definitely the highlight is when they come back to Earth. There are some really funny sound effects added in here. Mm. There's um, a baby crying, and there's a man kind of laughing, just showing how life is continuing all around them, but the sounds are like this. It's like literally, like, ah, ah. <laughs> And like then I always remember baby. the one guy saying, big issue, big issue. Oh, yeah. And I thought big he sounded issue. French. He was like, big issue, big issue. And I was like, are they in France? And then the man's laugh is like, oh, 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 oh. Well, apparently, originally, it was in the script that this was meant to be right in central London. I think it was meant to be in Piccadilly Circus. And it meant for them another trip to London because they were shooting in oh, Wales. Right, yeah. And the budget and the schedule meant they couldn't allow that. So Russell had to kind of adjust his script to something that wasn't in his vision. But since then, he said he prefers it the way it ended up being, where it's like it's a normal street. A normal street you can't place it anywhere they would have just shot it in cardiff yeah and it really leads that point of rose saying like i'm back on earth but not anywhere specific i can be anywhere i can do anything and i can always come back home and i think that's a really interesting yeah happy accident that's very true Mm. i can almost definitely say which street in cardiff it is every time i've been to cardiff since you know 2005 which is every time <laughs> been I've been hunting gone. um yeah every time you can spot them I mean, these these filming spots really stick out if you're looking for them and i'm pretty sure i, I want to say it's like queen street or something like that do you know I, i've never I, been to cardiff that's a real shame it's lovely it's yeah. really, really i've been nice. to wales i've just never been to cardiff oh it's doctor who heaven it's mm. crazy it's so nostalgic i'd always just think of that main center where they have in torchwood by that huge building yes. with the gold roof that's mm-hmm. what i always think of when i think of like shooting in wales doctor yeah who. the bay is extremely torchwood but there's mm. so many doctor who spots all sure. over cardiff yeah exactly and now bristol it feels like they're spilling out into bristol a bit now but oh yeah no they were shooting quite a lot <laughs> still not allowed to come back all the way to london yet well no i have it so for the filming photos i've seen from uh the new series of rusty davies 2 uh when they're shooting in camden i'm like that's just down the road yeah. i can go there and in yeah. the trailer they were in camden and I was it like, feels I was very just... strange and wrong when they film anything in um in yeah london. in london mm. but also so right that's so right oh and i think that basically takes us to the end of to the end of the end of the world yeah the end of the end of the world yeah. did you enjoy this episode i did um I, I did like this episode i think it's it's funny like looking back at it when um we've just had the power of the doctor come out mm. and like they, they are they are just worlds apart in terms of how they 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 feel mm. and um the visuals now yeah it's it's really jarring to go back um, but it still holds up as such a classic. Mm-hmm. You know, I adore it. They are really, really great episodes. The the quality of writing really holds up. And yeah. the characters are amazing. Exactly. I loved it. Would you like a couple of fun facts about the end of the world? Go on, then. Go on, then. Well, one thing that I thought was interesting is they filmed this episode at the same time as filming The Unquiet Dead, the next episode. Mm. And Eve Miles, who was filming a character in that episode, who then also came back to play Gwen in Torchwood, she was the stand-in for Cassandra. So oh. when they filmed any episodes and Cassandra would have dialogue, she would come in and read the lines for Cassandra. Oh, which I thought oh was my god, Eve Miles is reading for Cassandra. Eve Miles did in for Cassandra. In That's those so scenes. strange. Yeah, I know. But they were just filming at the same time and they were like, well, we're already paying you to be here. I'd love to, to see do this. that. I know. I scrolled the internet trying to find any kind of behind the scenes footage of that. It's probably locked in the BBC archives. Locked somewhere. away somewhere. Yeah. Like, it's no way. 2005 might as well be the year dot. Like, yeah. it's nowhere. But I thought that was just so interesting. This is also episode two for two for the Doctor pulling someone's arm off, which I feel is very like Star Wars. I mm. thought almost like chopping someone's hand off. And not so much a fun fact, but one thing that I thought was interesting is when Jabe asks if Rose is a prostitute and she's like, no, whatever I am, I'm obviously invisible. Billy Piper then went on to play prostitutes in multiple different shows. There was Secret Diary of a Cool yeah. Girl, Penny Dreadful. And I just thought that was an yeah. interesting <laughs> come off. Probably not of this episode, but certainly coming round to Another it. legendary series that I should not have been able to watch, but I did. Secret Diary. Secret Diary. Secret Diary. I was going to say Keeping Up. <laughs> keeping Up with Secret Diary of a Cool Girl. Hey, well, that's basically what the show ends up being. Keeping Up with a Cool Girl. Well, it did, it, 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 it turn into that, yeah. 
Well, thank you very much, dear listener, for listening to another episode of Hula La. Hula La. Hula La. And going forwards, we want to hear from you. Would you like us to keep going through series one? Would you like us to jump between you who? Would you like us to maybe look back at some classic episodes? I have not seen very many classics. I have a couple that I would actually love to show you that I know you've not seen. Get out the Brit Box. Get out the Brit Box and we'll get to step in. Uh, But thanks as always for joining us and we will see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.